Guys, it's that time of week again. It's book review time. And this week's book is Shashi Farooq, Inglorious Empire, subtitled What the British Did to India. And Shashi Farooq is an Indian politician who, in this book, details how the British Raj exploited India, destroyed their cultural heritage, impoverished millions of Indians, in fact, murdered Indians, millions of them, and basically took India and made it a British financial, you know, cash cow, if you will. And he details quite heavily throughout the book the injustices, the way the British destroyed British uh, Indian industry. For instance, shipbuilding. They stopped Indians building ships by destroying their shipbuilding firms and instilled British shipbuilding companies and firms. They actually banned Indian sailors from being employed and operating in the country. The uh, British still they took that and destroyed that. And he talks about also how before the British came to India, India, India actually had a rich cultural heritage and actually had institutions of education and industry and things like that that were actually rivaling Britain. And he talks about how when or just before India was taken over by the East India Company or before the East India Company got involved with India, India had 23% of the world's GDP, nearly a quarter. And when they left, when the British left in 1947, it had been dwindled to 3%. And he details throughout the book how this came to pass. Because British taxes, which were levied against the Indians when the British came, weren't reinvested. And the, and the industry that Britain was using in India wasn't reinvested. The profits from those, those ventures weren't reinvested and spent in India and used to benefit Indian people. They were used to benefit Brits. He details how you know the viceroys and the the representatives in India took the profits that they made and sent it back home and didn't reinvest any of it. He does give credit to the British where credit is due. For instance, the uh, game of cricket and the literature that was opened up to the Indian people. He does give credit where that's due, but he lays the credit for. Indians using them at the feet of the Indians who actually used them. For instance, Gandhi was educated by a British institution. And he doesn't say, he doesn't, doesn't go as far to say that Gandhi benefited from the British colonial experiment in India. But he does go on to say that, yes, while British education enabled people like Gandhi and nationalists to twist it and use it against the British occupation, but that doesn't mean that the British are responsible for Gandhi and for independence. So it's very, very striking. I've got my highlight around on this one, so like highlighting passages, because I, I like to do that when I find a book fascinating. Uh, it also talks about the monarchy, when the monarchy took over from the trading company, and things like that, and how racism was quite prevalent in the British Raj, how bureaucrats and politicians and things were predominantly British, and the British would select who they wanted to be in, in the power. And they, they essentially made the Indian systems of representation toothless. They didn't make them very powerful at all. For instance, just 4% of the covenanted positions in the Indian civil service, the top cadre, were filled by Indians in as late as 1930. So they, they were deliberately keeping Indian natives out of politics, out of industry as much as they could. <clears throat> and then it even says here, it was only when World War I drove thousands of young British men to officer duty in the trenches rather than service in the empire that the British grudgingly realised the need to recruit more Indian. And then he talks about the, the India before the British Raj as well. He does acknowledge that it has its flaws, but he also said it had a, ri a rich cultural heritage of education, institutions of education and healthcare and things like this that the British just didn't understand and that they helped to destroy. Even right away towards the end of the book, he details the partition of India and how India's conflict with Pakistan is largely laid to be laid at the feet of the British because they just drew a line and they didn't take into account the culture and the, you know, the people that lived there and the, and the ethnicities and the religions. They just drew a line and then that's how we ended up with Pakistan and India always at war with each other. He details how Pakistan only got a certain percentage of India's population, but they got a large portion of India's military in respect to their population that they got, 
And that's why Pakistan had to create this military threat, invent this military threat in order to justify the expenditure, the, the, the money, the, the expenditure of pa Pakistani army. And that's why they're going to war with India. Details how Hindus and Muslims like to live together and, and celebrate together. And they even went to festivals and religious celebrations together before the Raj. And then the Raj came along, did loads of censuses, and they said, right, you're Indian, you're Muslim, you're, you're, you're Sikh, you're Hindu, whatever it is. And they then essentially fostered a culture of separatism, divide and rule, they essentially fostered a culture of separation rather than before, it had all been sort of together, everyone had sort of got along. So that's very interesting to read. Go ahead and pick that up. It's very, very worth reading. If you're interested in British history, remember, you can be patriotic. It's one thing to be patriotic, it's another thing to be patriotic to the extent where you're ignorant of your own country's crimes. So go ahead and read that. That was Shashi for Raw, Inglorious Empire. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next one.